Happy Easter. And as I always like to say, happy resurrection morning, because that is what it is that we celebrate here today. And thank you for coming and being a part of a resurrection morning celebration here at Hope Church. I want to give a, a shout out or two uh, to some very special folks who helped make it all possible. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, uh, for those of you who are here uh, somewhat regularly, we have a new projector. Yeah! Isn't that awesome? And our First Impressions team did such a great job getting the lobby ready. Our Connect team did a great job getting the Resurrection Cross ready. And our stage design team did a great job getting our stage and our set stuff ready. So thank you, everyone, who helped make all of this possible. It is an exciting time to be here at Hope Church, and I'm glad that you chose to make Hope Church part of your Easter celebration. Now, how many of you have already had an egg hunt today? Today, already. Wow. I tell you what, a couple, a couple. Yeah, um, the, when I was growing up, the Easter Bunny would always come and, and deliver the eggs, and we would always have uh, a great egg hunt at the house before we went to church. Uh, and then as we had our kids, uh, we did the same thing. It was always so special to be able to get up and see the Easter baskets and hunt the eggs. It was always so much fun. And I know that there are lots of people who are excited to help us snag the 4,000 some odd eggs that are out there. Now, I will confess that number has increased some throughout the week. Uh, it started at 3,000. Some of that is because we've even been getting eggs coming in this morning, and some of it is just preacher math. But bottom line is, we've got a ton of eggs out there. So after the message is over and the service is over, uh, I look forward to, uh, to watching this. Because today we really are focusing on the Easter egg and how and why the Easter egg uh, developed such prominence in our culture, particularly as we celebrate this high and holy day. So, Easter eggs. That's what we are discussing today. So if you have not done so already, if you have the insert inside your uh, info guide to do the follow-along notes, or if you have happened to uh, download or have your Hope Church Plus app handy, uh, I also posted them on our Hope Church website uh, under our blog page with links as well on Facebook and on YouTube. So you should be able to find them if, you would, if you're so interested. The ones on the app are fill in the blank as well. But we have our uh, message that we're going through today called Easter Symbols. Now, for starters, I want us to look at the history of Easter eggs. Do all the world, and they did exactly what Jesus commanded them to do, to go tell the whole world about the love of God, about the forgiveness of sins, and baptizing them, and bringing them into what we know now as the church, for the sake of introducing people to Jesus and fueling their love for him. That's our specific mission statement here at Hope Church, but it speaks to what it is that we are called to do as followers and believers in Jesus. There are all kinds of movements afoot that want us to think, well, maybe it was just a myth or just a good story. That's not at all. It's historical. And one of the reasons that these deceptions or things began to run rampant, of course, the enemy doesn't want the world to know that Jesus really lived and he really died and his tomb is still empty because he is still alive. But the other reason is, the reason these deceptions and this confusion came about was because it was common when those disciples, those apostles, went into other parts of the world to take things that might have been familiar to them, like an egg, and use that to teach the story of Jesus, but not just to teach the story of Jesus, to show how Jesus is supreme over all. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 28, the apostle Paul is in this pantheon, so to speak, of where all of the known gods were given idols and places to be known. And there was this one idol that was made to the unknown God. And that is where we see one of the most powerful and poignant Bible passages where the Apostle Paul talks about how that unknown God is Jesus of Nazareth who lived 
who was executed and who rose again. And it is in him who we live and we move and we have our being. Jesus is supreme over all. And that is how some of this confusion came to be. We look at things like Easter eggs, which are indeed symbols of fertility and symbols of springtime, which is why we see that eggs help us symbolize new life. And we're not just talking about springtime. We're not just talking about April or March, whenever we would celebrate Easter, because what we're looking, what we're talking about is salvation. That's the message that it was shown how Jesus was shown to be supreme. That he wasn't just a, a good moral man. He wasn't just a good example. He wasn't just a teacher. He was all those things. But he was the son of the living God. So much so that even one of Jesus' brothers, who thought that Jesus was a little at some point early on in his ministry, came to believe that his half-brother, was indeed the Son of God. So much so that the religious leaders of the day who were trying to get him to recant his story actually took him to the top of the temple and demanded that he recant all that he had been saying about how his half-brother, or brother for that matter, was indeed the Son of God. And what did his brother say? I cannot deny Yahweh, which was the Jewish name for God. Even the people who denied, betrayed, and didn't even fully believe at one point that Jesus was who he said he is, gave their life over for this man. Friends, that is strong, powerful evidence. Because people might die for a good person, but they're not going to die for a wacko. They're not going to die for a liar. But they died for God. And they became martyrs. So eggs have this connection in the non-Jewish area, but they also have connections in Judaism. I want to go through these really quickly. The first way that we look at eggs is they were eaten in the Passover meal, what we might call today as the Seder. They were symbolic of the ancient Israelite tears when they were in slavery in Egypt. And, and more modern accounts, accounts of the Seder meal, in addition to the tears of the ancient Israelites when they were in slavery, it also refers to the tears that fell as, as a result of the temple being destroyed. And eggs were oftentimes the first food that was eaten after a funeral, believe it or not, in the Jewish tradition and custom, because of how eggs symbolize tears. And so we see these connections in Judaism that show how God has been part of this plan and this program to save all of humanity from the going back into the ancient times in Exodus and beyond. And so as this took root in ancient Judaism, as well as in the pagan areas to show how Jesus was supreme over all, early Christianity also adapted and adopted the egg as a symbol because eggs were oftentimes used in Holy Week fasts. This week that we just completed, that started with Palm Sunday a week ago today, and went through Christ's betrayal, his Last Supper, his execution, his death, and then culminating today in Easter Sunday. Eggs were thought to be part of Holy Week fasts in early Christianity. The thing was, is that uh, even though the people who were ardent followers of the faith, they didn't eat eggs, that didn't mean that the hens quit laying them. And so they had an overabundance of eggs come resurrection morning. And so then it became prominent to use eggs and decorate them and get them ready for resurrection morning. And it's believed that the Lutheran Christians in Germany around the 13th century are the ones that helped make this such a prominent part of our Easter celebrations, and they brought this into America and the New World. And so we see this history that goes all the way back, thousands and thousands of years, even before Jesus was born and he lived and he died and was resurrected. We see it in historical Judaism. We see how uh, early Christians began to adopt the Easter egg 
as a part of their Holy Week fasting and celebration, but also part of the Resurrection Morning celebration that talks about salvation and new life and new hope thanks to what it is that God did and does for every single one of us. We also see how those early apostles and those early Christians went into areas outside of the Jewish and the Christian faith to use something as simple as an Easter egg to help show how Jesus is God and supreme over them all. And so even today, we still use Easter eggs prominently in our Easter celebrations. For example, an egg hunt that we're going to have in a, in a few minutes. Probably not soon enough for the kids, but bear with me, right, children? So we're going to have an Easter egg hunt that reminds us how on the first resurrection morning, when those who went to go help prepare Jesus' body, they did not find him. And what did they do? They started looking for him. And as we'll see in a few moments, an angel of God came and said, why do you seek the living among the dead? Easter egg hunts are symbolic of that first resurrection morning search to try to find the one who they thought was dead and is now alive. Egg rolls, I'm not talking about the delicious appetizer that you may get at a, at a Chinese restaurant. Or if you like Huey Louis, they make some excellent avocado egg rolls, right? I'm talking about like what's going to take place tomorrow morning at the White House when you have an egg and you roll it down the hill. Egg rolls are symbolic of rolling away the stone that sealed the tomb of Christ. And what happened when they opened, or when they got there, they saw the stone had been rolled away. What did they see? That the tomb was empty. And so with the plastic eggs that we see and that you'll see in the later on, the whole idea is you open up the egg and you see that it is not filled with what you might expect, like a baby chick or a white and a yolk. It is instead containing a treat, a prize, something for which we should be grateful and joyful. Friends, the goodies in the Easter egg. And I love Cadbury cream eggs. Somebody left a whole bunch of them on my desk. Thank you, whoever you were. Uh, can't wait to dig into those. Today is a feast day. But we look at the Easter egg because it reminds us of our tears that have welled up when we recognize we've not lived the way that God wants us to live. The Easter egg reminds us of the new life that Jesus wants to offer you when you give your life to him and you invite him into your heart. And it becomes not just a toy, but a tool to help teach others about the supremacy of God and how, as the scripture tells us over and over again, Jesus was present in the beginning. Jesus is present right here with you right now. All things in the world are held together by the love and the grace of God. Jesus Christ. This morning downstairs in our Hope Kids area, they are learning something known as the resurrection eggs story. And I figured since today is the perfect day to talk about Easter eggs, that we would do the same thing in here this morning. And so if you have children who are downstairs, they will be learning these lessons also at the same time, different level, of course, but they're going to be learning these as well with this whole goal of all of us from a family point of view to be able to see how God lives and moves and we find our being in him. When we look at the egg and we remember our tears from breaking God's heart, we remember our new life that comes when we give our lives over to Jesus and as a tool and not just a toy to help the world know that God is real. He lives. He loves you and has a plan and a purpose for your life. So let's use the resurrection egg symbols to help us retell and remember the story that leads up to and declares the preeminence of God on Easter Sunday morning. How about it? You ready? All right. Very good. So over here we have our very first resurrection egg, which reminds us of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we should have a slide for this. Yeah, very good. Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Jesus was riding on a donkey, and the people were waving palm branches. And what were they shouting? It's on the screen. It rhymes with Rosanna. 
Hosanna, that's right, Hosanna means save us now. Deliver us, save us now. It also is a word that we use in praise. So it's a praise and a prayer that says, God, I know you are real. Save us now from the sins that have caused me to grieve what I've done and who I've been apart from you. Hosanna, may I praise you and pray to you as you enter into my life triumphantly. Next, we have, what is it? A pouch full of money. Ooh. I guess there are 30 pieces of silver in here. They look like nickels, but they're really silver. <laughs> but this reminds us that on Wednesday before Jesus' execution, Judas, one of his 12 disciples, betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That tells us that God knows the sting of betrayal. Just like perhaps you do when things haven't gone the way that you thought or expected them to go, when people have been cruel or double-minded or double-mouthed, backstabbing, that Jesus himself knows the sting of betrayal. The third resurrection egg reminds us with a washcloth, that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And he gave them an example and a model to follow about how the greatest virtue that the follower of Christ can have and feel is to dedicate his and her life to service. Jesus recognized that the disciples probably didn't fully understand what was happening at the time, but he told them, you will. And when you do understand, I want you to commit and dedicate your life to service, just like this Jesus said, I have dedicated my life to serving you. Jesus had every right to demand that other people serve him, but he said the greatest is the one who stoops down and helps to meet people in their lost, least, dirtiest, broken times. Jesus modeled this just before he went to the cross. The fourth egg, this one's a tough one to crack. A real tough one to crack. There we go, okay. It's the loaf and the cup. Jesus' last supper. It was the Passover meal when the Passover lamb was to be slain and sacrificed to take away the sins. Jesus, when he gave the Last Supper as part of their Passover meal, what he indicated to those who gathered there was that he was now changing the meaning of the meal, not just from a remembrance of what happened in the past, how God led the Israelites out of Egypt and into the Promised Land, he was saying, now I'm leading you on a new journey forward. Jesus turned it from looking backwards to looking forward to say, I need you to find the nourishment of God, the Holy Spirit, and of righteousness. And remember, remember. That's one of the key words that we see in the Last Supper is that we are called to remember who Jesus did, who it was, and what Jesus did. Our next egg represents Jesus praying in the garden with prayer hands. This isn't just a great emoji. It's a great reminder of what Jesus asked of the disciples in the garden of Gethsemane. Stay with me and pray. In that time, Jesus said one of the most human things that perhaps you can relate to. He said, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. He was so sad and so upset and felt so brokenhearted that he could have just died. Friends, maybe you've been there. 
maybe you've had to fight off some of those thoughts and some of those feelings. What this tells us is that Jesus knows that anguish and the brokenheartedness. And the first thing we should do when we find ourselves so low is to stay with God because he is always with you. He is as near as your very next breath. So even if you find yourself crushed with grief to the point that you'd rather just give up, Jesus says, give in to him in prayer and allow him to steady and stabilize your heart and your life. Our next egg, pieces of leather. When Jesus was beaten, this is an awful tame representation of what it was like. The verse there in Matthew that I reference on the screen indicates that they were tipped with lead pieces as well as broken pieces of pottery and even bone and teeth. And when Jesus was lashed, it wasn't just a simple lash. They would hit his back and then pull to rip the flesh and the muscle even down into the bone. And so Jesus was beaten to the point where he was hardly even recognizable, disfigured, broken. But the scripture tells us from the Old Testament into the New is that it is by his wounds that we find our healing. It's the blood of Christ that washes us of our sin. And even though, as our song Homecoming sang, even though our sin causes us to be stained with a crimson stain, it's the blood of Jesus that bleaches it and washes it all away. And so Jesus' woundedness was for your healing. Next, we have the crucifixion of Jesus, where Jesus himself was crucified. He was hung on a tree or a cross. His hands and his feet were nailed to it. A crown of thorns was placed on his head to give total pain and humiliation. He was most likely stripped completely naked, and he was hung in the sun to rot. Just before Jesus died, however, and gave up his last breath, he declared, it is finished. When he said it is finished, he was talking about the power, the threat of sin over our lives. He was talking about the wrath of God that was developed because of our sin and our brokenness. He said it is finished. And then he breathed his last. While he was on the cross before he took his last breath, the Roman soldiers played a game for Jesus' clothes. More like a gambling game where they were rolling dice. And the background image on the screen is a picture of some ancient Roman gambling dice. No idea if they were used on that day. But imagine what it would be like while you were suffering on the cross for people's sin. And you see people right there gambling and playing games for your clothes. But all of this, as the scripture tells us emphatically, was to fulfill prophecy. Christ's death on the cross was God's prophetic work and action that enables us to experience salvation through the forgiveness of sins. It's not based on anything that you've done or I've done or that we've done as a church or community. It's based solely on our faith in what Jesus did for us. Which leads us to our next egg. Again, another tough one to crack. There we go. A sword. This one is especially sharp, children. So if you come up to the stage afterwards, please be very careful with it. But as. An eclipse brought darkness over the earth, and it was nearing the Passover, the time when 
the sun was to set anyway. They wanted to expedite the death of the criminals, Jesus and the two crucified on either side of him. When they got to Jesus, he had already expired. He had already died. And so a Roman soldier used a sword or a spear to pierce Jesus' side. The scripture gives us kind of a gruesome image there that as soon as he pierced the side of Jesus, that blood and water poured out separately. What this indicates is that Jesus most likely died not from asphyxiation, but from a heart attack. Jesus is God's heart was broken. Now, this takes us back into the book of Genesis before we see Noah and his family and two by two of each animal board the ark. The reason that God destroyed the world with a flood was because he saw how evil and sinful people were, and as Genesis tells us, it broke God's heart. And after God cleansed the earth and repopulated it with Noah and Noah's family and the animals, he made a pledge and a promise that is given with a rainbow in the clouds that says, I will never destroy the earth that way again. And as a result, he set forth a plan in motion that Jesus himself would take on the heartbreak of God and pay that penalty to fulfill the wrath and in so doing, help us to find the healing and the hope that comes from what we see next. Our next egg is strips of linen where Jesus was wrapped probably somewhat in a rushed and a hurried way because the sun was setting, which is why Jesus was just placed in the tomb and the women were going to come back on resurrection morning to finish wrapping his body and preparing it for ultimate burial. This reminds us that Jesus himself was born to die. If you look back into the Christmas passage, the Christmas message, what we see is that when Jesus was born, he was wrapped in strips of cloth. It's a direct connection from Christ's birth to Christ's burial. The strips of cloth remind us that Jesus was born to die, not just for the gruesome spectacle of it, but for the salvation that comes when we give our life over to him. And so our next egg, egg number 11, begins to move us into this idea of security. Secure? Matthew, the verse there that's referenced on the screen, is the only passage that gives us any indication of what happened between Jesus' death and then placing him in the tomb just before sunset on Friday and what happened when the sun rose on resurrection morning, there was concern because of everything that Jesus had said that he was going to somehow vacate the grave. Now, the people didn't believe that he really was who he said he was, but they were still fearful that maybe his disciples could find a little ounce of courage and maybe go and steal Christ's remains. And so they, they went to Pilate, and Pilate said, put a guard there and secure the tomb. And I love the little detail, the little nugget that Matthew gives. He says, secure the tomb as best you can. Rome was a superpower. And it would be very similar to how perhaps one of our state governors was concerned about something happening in the boundaries of that state and said, I'm going to send the National Guard out to protect and to secure that location. Secure? As best you can? Disciples who just a few hours before were so frightened that they ran away, denied knowing Jesus at all? They were going to be brave enough to go and seal Jesus' body? I don't think so. And so we get this nugget that helps us to see that when we place our faith in government or things like military might, that it always pales in comparison to the resurrecting power of God 
that is made available to you and me when we place our faith in him, which leads us to our last resurrection egg, which is... Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. It's empty then. Do, 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 do. It's empty now. <laughs> Friends, the tomb was empty then and it is empty now. The resurrection of Jesus. His body was not there. And it's not there today. Just simple, fun things that we use, like Easter eggs, to remind us that this story of Jesus. It's historical. It points back to how God decided he was going to free the world of the stain and the stain of sin. He was going to give us the opportunity and the ability to experience new life because of who he was and what he accomplished in us through his son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to find ways to use things that are familiar to people to help tell the story of who Jesus is, what Jesus does, and how he can change your life. Shortly before Jesus' betrayal, execution, and resurrection, he learned that one of his friends named Lazarus was very ill. And Lazarus' sister, Mary and Martha, maybe you've heard about them in the scripture, they sent for Jesus and they got a little aggravated that he didn't come as soon as they sent for him. Have you ever gotten aggravated with God? He didn't do something on your timeline? It happened in the New Testament, too. And when Jesus got there, he saw all of Lazarus' friends and family gathered there in the tomb where he was. And we see something really interesting. Maybe you've heard of the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus was moved to tears. And so what did Jesus do when he saw the grief in people's hearts? He wept. Again, connecting tears and grief. But there's something else that happened. Two other things that happened. One, the scripture tells us that he got a little indignant, got a little angry that people were questioning him and his authority over all of heaven and earth. And so he spoke to Mary and Martha separately. And as a result, we see these words As we skip down to John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, for the sake of time. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus got a little indignant that they didn't believe him. But then he asked this question that you see on the screen. Do you believe this? Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave to let everyone know that he indeed did have the power over death. And as you would probably imagine, there is enough evidence to convince even the strongest doubter that a man named Lazarus died and was brought back to life. From Jesus. Friends, this message that he asked of Mary and Martha, he also wants to ask of you today. Do you believe this? Do you believe that God created you with a plan and a purpose for your life? Do you believe that sin gets in the way? And that's a churchy word, sin, but it's just a Greek archery term that means to miss the mark. Sometimes we miss that target accidentally, despite our best efforts, and sometimes we miss it intentionally. Sometimes we say, if we're going to sin, just go ahead and sin boldly. But God sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die for the power and the threat of sin, to save you and to save all the world, so that it need not be destroyed by flood again. But we would all have the opportunity to live and live a new life. In a few weeks, Memorial Day weekend, actually, we're going to celebrate the Sunday of Pentecost, which is the story of how God sends his Holy Spirit into our lives to make us alive in hope and power and love for him. And he wants us to connect with other faithful believers 
to remember where we've been, to commit to him where we are, and to look forward into the future to finding ways to introduce people to Jesus and fuel their love for him. In simple toys and tools like Easter eggs, but also the stories that we have that show how our tears fall because of the grief and the anguish and the betrayal and the hate that we see, we feel, we experience in the world. But the power of resurrection that shows us that Christ's life in us is bigger than anything that we could ever possibly imagine. And as a result, he wants to fill the emptiness of your life with his Holy Spirit to help you in your ongoing mission to introduce other people to him and to fuel their love and life for him. So hear this invitation as the band comes forward to bring us in our closing song. If you've not yet received the love and the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, who was born for the sake of taking on the sin of the world and your individual sin, I want to invite and encourage you to not let this day pass you by. Allow the power of God to speak into your heart and to call you forth, just like Jesus called Lazarus forth. Lazarus forth. And I want you to remember the story of how Christ came, and yes, he was sacrificed for us, but he lives again so that we may live as well. And perhaps as we went through the eggs here, you may want to come back through and, and see where you are in some of this, crying out for Christ to save you now, to experience relief from the betrayal that you felt, to know that Christ wants to serve you and to clean you, and he wants you to remember what he's done and to stay and to pray with him. He's taken the lashes that you deserved that only he could handle, and it was on the cross that he offers you a gift that only you can give. And there are times we want to play games with our salvation. There are times we want to try to gamble it away, but Christ still remains whole. His heart broke, broke then and breaks still for the sin in the world. But as we remember, he was born to die. He is still wrapping us up in the all-purpose garment of love that he wants us to be deployed out into the world. And he wants to secure you and to secure your salvation forever that is far greater than any stone or any governor or any army could secure. It all comes down to Jesus because that tomb was and still is empty so that our lives, your life right here today, can be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to save you now and forever. You pray with me, please. Living and loving God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for resurrection morning. I thank you for the symbols that we have around us, the sacred ones, the ones that break our hearts, the ones that remind us of how far we have fallen at times, but also, Lord, the symbols that we see that are fun and whimsical. All of them, Lord, are tools for us to know that you indeed are real, that you love us, and you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. We cannot thank you enough for taking the nails on that Good Friday because you could far better take the pain of crucifixion than the pain of knowing that we would not be in eternity with you forever. So Lord, as we confess not just our sins, but our even nature that is bent towards sinning, I pray that we feel your wholeness in your life filling us this morning with your Holy Spirit so that as we leave this place and we go and we enjoy things like Easter eggs and carrot cake and ham and whatever else is on the agenda for today, I pray for that all of us reminds us of the joy of that empty tomb so that you can fill our empty lives with your Holy Spirit and we may be deployed out into our community and across all creation to fill the world with your love. We ask this in the holy, helping, healing name of Jesus, who on this day we celebrate his victory over the grave. Amen.